Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. If you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, we would love you to. And you can do so by going to patreon.com forward slash the History Network. Thank you so much to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. The History Network.org podcast, season 34, episode 5, Iron of Valour. Only man awarded both the Victoria Cross and the Iron Cross. This episode was written by Murray Darm. Murray is an ancient and medieval military historian from New Zealand living in Australia. He has written more than 100 articles on various aspects of ancient and medieval military history, as well as other historical topics from all periods, ranging from the history of opera to the runic alphabet and recipients of the Victoria Cross. He is author of Macedonian Phalangite vs. Persian Warrior, Athenian Hoplite vs. Spartan Hoplite, and Leuctra 371 BC, all from Osprey Publishing. He is a regular on the Ancient Warfare podcast, as well as a regular writer for us here. Only one man has ever been awarded both the Victoria Cross and the Iron Cross, Surgeon General William Manley. In 1864, he was awarded a VC for his actions during the Siege of Gate Pa, during the New Zealand Wars. Then, when the Franco-Prussian War broke out in 1870, Manley went with the British Ambulance Corps attached to the Prussian Army. In December 1870, he was awarded the Iron Cross Second Class for bravery in several engagements around Chateau Neuf, Bretoncel, Orleans and Favon. The New Zealand Wars were a series of conflicts fought by British and colonial troops against various Maori tribes between 1845 and 1872. Fifteen Victoria Crosses were awarded during the wars. Initially, the wars were localised land disputes with individual Maori tribes and the colonial New Zealand government. By the 1860s, however, 10,000 British troops had been requested by the new governor of New Zealand, Sir George Grey. These were to be used to suppress the wider Maori king, Kingi Tanga, movement and suppress more unified resistance. Even though the campaigns remained relatively localised. In 1863 and 1864, the 68th Durham Light Infantry Regiment and 43rd Regiment of Foot had arrived in New Zealand from Burma and India respectively to reinforce the colonial forces. Commander of all forces in New Zealand, Lieutenant General Sir Duncan Cameron, had decided to invade the Waikato south of Auckland and end the Kingitanga movement. In July 1863, the invasion was launched, even though most of the British reinforcement forces had not arrived in the country. Reinforcements were sent to the front as soon as their ships docked in Auckland and the men had swapped their red uniforms for the blue of the New Zealand campaigns. The initial campaign was criticised for lack of progress and it meandered over the Waikato. Contemporary soldier and adventurer, the Prussian Gustavus von Tempsky, remarked, Everyone was mad, gloomy and brooding over the prospect of an endless campaign. By April 1864, Cameron had switched his focus and moved his forces to the Turanga region on the east coast of the North Island. The 43rd Regiment arrived in late 1863 and the 68th Regiment landed in January 1864 and marched to Turanga arriving there on April 21st. This was just in time to mount an attack on a Maori defensive position built on a neck of land only 275 metres wide, flanked by swamp on each side and built deliberately 
to antagonise the government troops, Puke Hina Hina, or Gate Pa. Cameron had surrounded the Pa with troops on all sides. The government forces outnumbered the 230 Maori warriors of the Ngai Terangi tribe who defended the Pa by at least 7 to 1, their assault force numbering 1,650 men. In addition, the government forces had the largest artillery contingent used in the war, consisting of various calibre Armstrong guns, howitzers and mortars. The artillery was brought up on the 28th of April, and during the night, four batteries were constructed. It was feared that the Maori defenders would evacuate if they saw the batteries being constructed, and so they were built in the dark. A small-scale, hour-long barrage was discharged on the 28th of April and followed with an eight-hour bombardment from dawn on the 29th. During this, 30 tonnes of shot exploded over or slammed down into the Pa, an area of only 1,400 square metres, less than a half a football pitch. The Pa was 80 metres long and 18 metres wide. The bombardment silenced all resistance and created a breach in the two metre wide and high parapet ideal for the coming infantry assault with no sign of life from the par the assault was ordered at four p m the frontal assault consisted of three hundred men one hundred and fifty from the naval brigade and one hundred and fifty from the forty third regiment commanded by Commander Hay of the Naval Brigade and Lieutenant Colonel Booth of the 43rd Regiment. They would charge in, four abreast, with bayonets fixed. Another 300 men stood in reserve. Meanwhile, 700 men from the 68th Regiment would approach the rear of the par. The events which followed are still unclear. Only 15 of the Maori defenders had fallen in the initial bombardment on the 28th, the remainder had taken their shelter in purposely built underground chambers and they remained there during the sustained bombardment of the 29th. There had been no signs of resistance or life during the long bombardment and Cameron no doubt expected that the 200 remaining defenders had been destroyed. When the assault was launched, some Maori resisted with shotgun and mere, the lethal Maori close combat hand weapon. This resistance was not enough to stop the assault from moving through the network of trenches and reaching the end of the par. A Captain Greaves reported back to Cameron that the par was taken and that casualties had been light. As the 68th Regiment reached the rear of the par, however, less than ten minutes after the frontal assault went in, the remnants of the assault column began running from the breach defences back towards the government lines. Of the 300 men who assaulted the PA, one-third were now casualties with 31 lying dead, including 10 officers and 80 wounded. After Captain Greaves's report, it seemed that the majority of the Maori defenders emerged from their underground shelters, largely unscathed, a lesson for future of the ineffectiveness of sustained bombardment on well-designed trench systems was clearly missed at Gate PA. Indeed, according to historian James Bellick, the Battle of Gate Park was arguably the most important battle of the New Zealand wars in terms of both its political effects and its wider implications for military technology. The Maori then poured a deadly fire into the British forces at close and even point-blank range. During the bombardment and assault, the Maori lost only 10 additional casualties. The Maori leader... Rawi Ri Puhirake may have engineered the entire affair, commanding his warriors to stay concealed and not to emerge from their shelters and fire at the British until ordered to do so. Certainly, the sudden and fierce resistance caught the government forces by surprise. At the moment they thought they had achieved a clear victory, they were met with unexpected and stout resistance. Such spirited resistance was totally unexpected and resulted in the entire assault collapsing in panic and being repulsed after they had claimed victory. Some early reports stated that the assault was repulsed before reaching the PAR by ferocious fire from the PAR's rifle pits, although this cannot explain Captain Greaves's report. 
In the confusion of the unexpected Maori defence, Assistant Surgeon William Manley behaved with uncommon valour. As the defeated attackers ran away from the Maori defences at Gate Pa, surprised at the ferocity of the defenders' counter-attack, Assistant Surgeon William Manley did not flee with the attackers, but made his way in the opposite direction, back into the Pa. Having attended to the mortally wounded commander of the force, Commander Hay, Manley returned to the body-strewn defences to find more wounded. Born in Dublin, William Manley joined the Army Medical Staff at the age of 24 in 1855, his mother's father having been an army surgeon. He was attached to the Royal Artillery and first served in the Crimea, seeing Sevastopol fall. He continued to serve with the Royal Artillery, the 4th Brigade of which arrived in New Zealand in March 1861. The brigade served in all the actions of the invasions of the Waikato in 1863 and 64, although it brought most guns to bear at Gate Pa. Assistant Surgeon Manley volunteered to go in with the initial assault force. According to his citation in the London Gazette of September 23, 1864, having volunteered to accompany the storming party into the Pa, he attended on Commander Edward Hay when he was carried away mortally wounded, and then volunteered to return in order to see if he could find any more wounded. Manley's acts of bravery were witnessed by Commodore Sir William Wiseman, C.B., who commanded one of the Royal Artillery Batteries, manned by Royal Navy personnel. It was to Wiseman's position that Hay's body was brought. From there, Manley returned to the par. Manley was the last to leave the par, and this is especially noteworthy given the scale and level of humiliation of the defeat of the government forces at Gate Par. The 31 killed and the 80 wounded was its worst defeat during the entire New Zealand wars. During the whole six-month campaign, total government losses were 44 killed and 119 wounded. Gate Par represented 70% of those casualties. The deep humiliation felt by the regiments and the forces throughout New Zealand as a whole is reflected in contemporary letters and reports. Major General Sir James Alexander later recalled that there is not a more gallant regiment than the 43rd, but now where were all the laurels they had won in the peninsula and India, soiled and trampled in the dust immediately after the defeat, however, it would seem that the Maori also tended to the government wounded. One Maori woman, Haini to Kiri Karamu, bringing water to the dying commander of the 43rd Regiment, Lieutenant Colonel Booth, and several other blue coats. In the same action at Gate Pa, captain of the foretop of the HMS Harrier, Samuel Mitchell, was also part of the initial assault force. He too was awarded the Victoria Cross for carrying Commander Hay from the PA, even though he had been ordered to seek safety. Hay lived long enough to ask Wiseman to recognise Mitchell's bravery. Interestingly, Mitchell's award was announced in July 1864, Manley's not until September, even though both were recommended by Commodore Wiseman, presumably at the same time. During the night of 29th and 30th of April, and expecting renewed assault the following day, the Maori forces evacuated the Pa, slipping through the lines of the 68th Regiment, although with some casualties, and escaped into the surrounding swamps. Cameron returned to Auckland with half his force, leaving Colonel Henry Greer in command of the remaining 800-odd men. Manley continued serving in the campaign, seeing the revenge of Gate Par with the defeat of the Maori at Taranga, a few miles away, on the 21st of June. In that engagement, only 13 British were killed, contrasted with the 120 Maori dead, most of whom were bayoneted. Two more Victoria Crosses were awarded for that action. Manley then continued serving under the command of Sir Trevor Shute, 
who replaced a disgraced Duncan Cameron in the Taranaki on the west coast of the North Island in 1865. Manley was mentioned in dispatches and promoted to staff surgeon. He also rescued a drowning sailor. Manley left New Zealand to return to Britain in February 1866. Shute's campaign was the last which involved imperial troops. Meanwhile, in Europe, there were growing tensions between the Second French Empire of Napoleon III and Prussia, which was leading the growth of German unification under the North German Confederation, especially after the Austro-Prussian War in 1866, which established Prussia's dominance of the German states and excluded Austria from any unification of German speakers into one nation. In July 1870, French fears of growing German power led to it declaring war against the Kingdom of Prussia. At the outbreak of the war, Assistant Surgeon Manley was put in charge of a division of the British Ambulance Corps, which was attached to the 22nd Division of the Prussian Army. The Prussian Crown Prince, Frederick, had married Queen Victoria's eldest child, Victoria, in 1858, cementing close ties between Britain and Prussia. The Prussians mobilised far more quickly than the French had anticipated, and the French were decisively defeated at the Battle of Sedan in September 1870, and again at the fall of Metz in October. The war continued under a new French government, declared after Napoleon III was captured at Sedan. Campaigns continued in the Loire Valley and in north and northeast of the country. Resistance and campaigning continued until Paris, besieged following the Battle of Sedan in September, fell in January 1871. The outcome was a humiliating peace imposed on France and German unification, consisting of 25 member states with the proclamation of the German Empire to coincide with the fall of Paris. The 22nd Division was made up of recruits, mainly from Thuringia, some were from the electorate of Hesse, and it participated in most of the major engagements of the war, the opening battle of Wart, Sedan, the siege of Paris, the Loire campaign. Manley and his ambulance corps were present throughout the war, and his citation for the Iron Cross explicitly mentions his actions in caring for the wounded of the 22nd Division at engagements during the Loire campaign at the battles of Orléans and Cravon, which had taken place on December 10th, then at Chateau Neuf and Bretoncel on December 18th and 21st, respectively. For these actions he was awarded the Iron Cross, second class, on the recommendation of Frederick, Crown Prince of Prussia. Frederick commanded the Third Army and was praised for his leadership and care for the wounded, visiting them on several occasions. His recognition of Manley's actions was entirely in keeping with such care and concern. Manley also cared for the French wounded during the Siege of Paris, Manley's career continued on into the Second Afghan War when he was present for the occupation of Kandahar in 1880, then in the Anglo-Egyptian War in 1882, where he was present at the Battle of Tel el-Kabir. He retired in 1884 an honorary Surgeon General. The unusual circumstances which led to Manley serving in both colonial and European conflict seconded to the army of prussia mean he is the only man to have been awarded the highest award for valour in both britain and prussia victoria cross and the iron cross in both instances he showed the utmost bravery in his care for the wounded and disregard of his own safety on both sides of the globe Thanks once again for that, Murray. If you would like to write a script for us or have an idea for a subject you'd like us to cover, drop us a line, info at thehistorynetwork.org. Once again, thank you to all our patrons who make this podcast possible, and if you would like to join them, 
just go to patreon.com forward slash the history network and sign up there thanks again for listening you've been listening to the history network.org podcast written by murray darm read by nick barker 